Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. The regular season hasn't even started, but if you look outside, it sure looks like the hockey season out there. I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, are you keeping warm? Yeah, it wasn't a very nice day yesterday, but at least the snow's already mostly gone. It sure looks like we're ready for the Heritage Classic, doesn't it? Yep. Last Tuesday, the 24th, the Winnipeg Jets came to town. They took on the Flames here at the Dome, and the Flames ended up winning with a big 2 nothing win. Preseason shutout for what it's worth. Uh, the Flames had a pretty much NHL-ready lineup and got goals from Monaghan and Bennett in this one. I really liked what I saw, but Matt, what did you think of this game? Uh, the team looked well. It, it's Whenever the Flames played their NHL players, they win. And, you know, you see, saw that in this game where it the, they just shut the Jets down. Riddick has looked very good in the preseason which i'm hoping that's you know if he continues to progress in his development that means that he'll be a fairly good goaltender which is pretty much the only chink in the flames armor at this point um like it last season that was the flames achilles heel for most of the year Uh, So if he can continue to play well, that would be excellent. And he collected the shutout in this game. Big Save Dave was the guy that I was the most excited to see as well. He had all 60 minutes, and while some of the guys looked like they were maybe 80%, they were kind of in preseason mode, Dave looked like he was focused, he looked like he was ready, and it looked like he's ready for the season to start. And I think he was giving it 100%. Yeah, well, we mocked him last year after that seven goal against stinker of a game that he the picture of you at the gas mask. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think you know he he has come into this preseason a lot more focused and prepared, and you know wanting to be good right from opening of training camp on. I think Dave comes in with a very different mindset this year. Last year, he was coming into this trying to become a regular NHL goaltender. He was fighting for that spot, especially after not looking great in the preseason. And this year, he's coming in as a guy who's expected to be a starter, as a guy who's probably expected to play 50-plus games, and a guy who they hired a veteran in Talbot to back him up. So, very different for him. Yeah, then hopefully he can take that next step and become one of the top-tier starters in the NHL. He has most of what you would need for that to happen in terms of skill set. It's just putting all the various parts together and making it work. The other Flames I really liked here, obviously the captain. Gio's looked good all preseason. He got 23-plus minutes in this game, and that's crazy for a guy of his age in the preseason. I also liked Hamannick and Hannafin. I think that we're seeing more from those guys, and they seem to be clicking a lot better now, so I'm excited to see the chemistry of them in the preseason. And then Rasmus Anderson, and you and I have talked a lot about how he's looking NHL ready now, and I think that was evident here. Yeah, and I would not be shocked if he pushes himself up in the lineup as the season goes on, or potentially allows the team to move on from TJ Brody even, uh, for next season and at least, and we'll see. He's an interesting player, he has a lot of upside, and... To me, his first step when he is moving is a lot better than it has been previously. And that he's always been a little bit on the sluggish side as a defenseman, but he seems to be a little bit quicker this year. And that will bode well for him moving forward. And the next game, unfortunately, was quite the slaughter. This was on Thursday the 26th. The Flames went to San Jose to take on the Sharks and played what I think we could say was far from an NHL-ready roster. I mean, if we look at some of the the forwards here, we had Ryan Reeder, Smith Pelly, Dubé, Ronaldo, Ferrosi, Philippe, Kirkland, Robinson, Jankowski, Mangiapane, Quine. But, you know, these guys have to have some credit for what they did, even though there's not a lot of NHL guys here. They had Talbot and Nett. And they were able to keep the pucks out of the net for 40 minutes, really against a Sharks team that was NHL ready and had a lot of NHL guys in. And then the Flames decided to put Zaga Doolin in in the third. And sort of like the Riddick game we talked about earlier, he didn't look so hot. 
Well, the thing is that even a few of the goals that uh, Zagadulin let in, they were very, yeah, very excellent tip redirections. Like, those hit your go in. And unfortunately, he had a lot of them go in. And, you know, he, you can criticize him for a lot of the things, but, you know, some of those goals, it, it, those would have went in on any goaltender in the NHL. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Um, I thought that Talbot was... You're right. They weren't all his fault. And I think when your goaltender's new to North America and he's taking on the likes of Evander Kane, Thomas Hurdle, um, Logan Couture... He still looked good. I mean, his position was good. He looked like he was sharp. I think he did everything we could ask for. Yeah, and he just needs time, and just like Riddick did. And I'm sure that he'll be facing a lot of rubber down in Stockton, and, you know, we'll see how he fares. But he he reminds me a lot of Riddick when Riddick first got here. And there was... We'll see. It... it there's enough positive there where you might think that this guy has an NHL future, which, you know, that in and of itself for somebody who just walked into the organization is pretty good. You and I have talked a lot in the last few years about the failed Flames European experiments that they've done. I mean, we saw them bring in Roman Chervanka, we've seen them bring in David Wolf, and neither of those guys really worked out well. So when they can go out and find Riddick and Zagadulin and bring them into the organization and they look good, that's great because especially when we've been trading away a lot of our draft picks, they're free assets. Oh, yeah, and that's why you always throw uh, contracts at European free agents because if any of them actually click and provide any use for you, then, hey, that's a freebie. And, it, you know, it, like you look at... Uh, Yellison, uh, the defenseman that the Flames also signed from Russia, he actually looked fairly good for being unfamiliar with North American hockey as well, and he looks like he might be one of the better Flames prospects at the moment, for th the defense at least. The Flames' goal in this game comes from Justin Kirkland and the assist from Buddy Robinson. Do you think these are the only two Flames points that these guys are going to get this year? Probably. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed it while you can. So, what you're what you're saying is that that was Kirkland's best of the season. He's already peaked, and the points aren't going to come in Costco size. <laughs> oh darn! Oh, if it did, then he'd be in the NHL. Let's move on to the next game. This was the Battle of Alberta, and it's weird this year. The first Battle of Alberta is not till December. Do you remember a couple years ago when we burned like half of our Battle of Alberta's in the first week of the season? I know. It's kind of uh, nicer to have those games later in the season because, you know, that's like post-Apex Edmonton, and, you know, like they're already going to be mailing it in by November. So, you know, we're going to catch them all in that post, you know, actually competing So hard. what you're saying is you think the Flames are going to be able to sweep the Oilers this year? I will go on record that I think the the Flames will sleep the Oilers this season. All right, I'm writing this down. What's today's date? September 30th. Uh, Matt predicts the Flames are going to sweep the Oilers this season. All right, Matt, it's in pen. I'm going to put it online. That means you're committed. And game winners will be by Lucic and Reader will score at least two game-winning goals against them. <laughs> well, if we're looking for all the former Flames to score, we got to sure Talbot's in there too. Well, he might score in the empty net. Getting back to the last preseason game, Saturday night was the Battle of Alberta, and the Flames played the Oilers. Uh, the Flames iced what's probably going to be pretty close, I would say, to their opening day roster that they'll bring to Colorado. And this was a pretty weird game, if you look at the score sheet and how things went down in this game. Yeah, you see, the Oilers are so bad that the Oilers scored all the goals and the Oilers still what lost. What Matt's talking about <laughs> is that the goals in this game for the Flames came from Tobias Reeder, who played for the Oilers last year, and they pretty much blamed all their failures on. And the second goal came from Milan Lucic, who was also an Oiler last year. And then the third goal, again, from Reeder for the Flames. The Flames got up early in the second with uh, goals from Reeder and Lucic. And then the Flames were able to hold on to that lead and control that lead. And then late in the third period, um, they ended up blowing the lead and letting Edmonton back in this with two goals. And I was kind of worried because we might get the thing I hate the most, which is overtime hockey in the preseason. True. 
I just don't understand the point of playing overtime in the preseason. At that point, you might as well just call it a tie and move on. It's like, oh, this is pointless. <laughs> so Tobias Reader gets the game winner for the Flames, and I think it's just so yeah. funny. It's very Battle of Alberta-like that all the former Oilers that are playing for the Flames ended up getting a goal. I actually ended up tweeting at one point from our Fireside Chat account, hey, Talbot, you're up. Next goal is yours. Like, it's just... It's very Battle of Alberta, isn't it? That that's the way that the goal scoring works. It's kind of funny. Oh, yeah. And you got to figure that those guys are a little enthusiastic to beat up on them. So, Looking at the it, Flames this game, I still think that Jankowski could be the odd man out on this roster. Possible. He's struggled this preseason. He doesn't look ready to go. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Janko moved between now and, say, the first part of November, even just to make room for another guy on this roster. Yeah. It, I I don't know what's really up with him, but it seems like uh, what happened with Colborn once he went to Colorado, where he just kind of faded off into the sunset. And, like, I don't know exactly what happened with Jankowski, where he looked relatively good for most of last season like not great but serviceable at least and at least what you needed from a bottom six center yeah and now it's like uh are you even going to be in the nhl like and that's a legitimate question and yeah, you know, like I wouldn't actually be surprised at this point if at the trade deadline that the flames go out and acquire a fourth line center uh, just to, ha you know, not have Jankowski in the lineup if he keeps playing like this. And I don't think he'll be in the lineup for very long if he does continue to play like this. We'll talk lineups a bit later in the show, but I think right now Janko has a spot on this team. The coaches and GM seem to like him, and it's his to lose, but he's not doing himself any favors. No. And coincidentally, uh, Dylan Dubé, like after we praised him up and down last week... The coach week, called him out. ...played... Yeah, it, which was, you know, we thought, well, that's interesting that he called him out right after, like, we had were singing his praises, and then the following games, yeah, he was quite awful, and, you know, obviously he was seeing something in the practices that was standing out, and, because in the games prior to that, he looked good, but, yeah, I can see him going down to Stockton, and staying for a bit and then the other notes that i had on this game of all the defensemen that the flames played which was anderson giordano brody hamannick mcdonald and hannafin i thought that mcdonald looked by far the worst defenseman here right. i'm surprised he got more minutes than hannafin did um but he definitely does not look like a guy who needs a top six spot on this team I'm not saying he's terrible, but I think he's, if he's going to be here, he's got to be the number seven. I'm not saying he's terrible, but there's definitely a gap between him and our guys. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to him being like the emergency guy in Stockton, sort of like Dalton Prout last season. And, you know, it, where he's just there. And, like, if you get run into injury troubles, he can come up and play like eight, nine, ten minutes and hopefully not screw things up too much. We'll talk about the big contract in a little bit here, but I think it's worth noting that Kachuk was on the ice for this one. It's his first and only preseason game, and they gave him a ton of ice time. He played 20 minutes and 18 seconds, so just over a whole period on the 3M line for most of the game. And I was watching him from the press box. I don't know what you thought, but to me, he looked good. He didn't look like he was a step behind. We often see these guys who miss preseason and look like they're a little bit behind the play, but looking at him, it looks like he's ready to go for the regular season. Oh, it's just like uh, Gaudreau when he signed his contract and missed the entire preseason that year. He just stepped in game one and was fine. And Kachuk, same thing. Uh, i gathering he was preparing a lot off the ice, you know, without the flames uh, until it was ready to go and pen to paper and okay let's go be a disturber again i also noted here this is at least the second game in a row where the flames had at least one too many men on the ice penalty which i hate to see because to me that's the most undisciplined penalty you can take so i'm hoping that come the start of the season the flames know how to count to five and we don't st spend more time in the box because of too many men on the ice true um it, th those things tend to come in spurts where you know just sloppy play overall and then 
That's what I'm you hoping. You tighten that up and like usually usually the coach will practice that like just line changes. I know it's preseason and it really doesn't matter, but to me it's just sloppy and undisciplined mentally. And I think in that San Jose game at one point, we had seven flames on the ice. And that's just, I don't know how you can get the count that And we wrong. still only scored one goal. <laughs> what more do you want? <laughs> Maybe the other two guys were Ronaldo and Smith Pelly. Yeah. Maybe that's why. After this game, the Flames made two signings, and let's talk about all three signings in this game, and we'll start with the new highest-paid Flame in history, number 19, Matthew Kachuk. Matthew Kachuk signed a three-year deal that has an average of $7 million, so that's what will count against the salary cap for us. Um, so $7 million bucks a year for him. I thought this was a little higher than we expected based on the point deal, but lower than what you and I pro- were projecting for him in the summer and going into the summer. I like this deal. It's high enough that he gets paid for what he's worth, but um, low enough that nobody has to move in order to make room on the cap. So I really can't complain about this one. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, like ideally the Flames would, I'm sure would have liked to have it like a six, seven, eight year deal, but you're probably looking at like nine and a half million dollars at that rate. And then you definitely have to delete for a leak and, or uh, Brody, and you're making the team less good. It, you know, it it sucks in that he'll only be one year away from UFA, and he could just opt to sign only a one-year deal after this one and go UFA, which that would be horrible. But I don't think that will be the case, and... You know, by the time that that's his contract's up, then, you know, the Flames will be having a lot of discussions with both him and Gaudreau and trying to figure out how to move forward. You're right. He could do another one-year deal when this one's over. But if this team is as successful as we think they're going to be in the next three years here and they're able to either get a cup or get pretty close to the cup, I don't know why he would want to leave here to go somewhere else. I think that if we can be successful, if we can see him bloom into a number one flame, I mean, he's already pretty close, but let's call him the number one left winger in three years. I don't know why you'd sign a one year and then go UFA after that. I think, you know, the flames have the option to woo him here long term. Yeah. I know, and it's the the concerns like that are like every time a Ginless contract would come up. Oh, he's gonna go away, and then yeah, he signed. And so like, I'm not overly. I've heard a lot of people who are disappointed about this being a three year deal, but remember, he can always resign, right? I mean, he can sign the three years, and then he can do another three years or six years, whatever he might want to do on the road. So. I don't think it's a bad thing this three years. It gives the team some flexibility. Who knows where Matty will be three years from now? Who knows where the Flames will be three years from now? Who knows what contracts are going to look like three years from now? So I think this is actually a good deal for the Flames. It's a reasonable price. It's a short term. And I think it's good because we've been burned by long contracts recently. And this is going to make sure that we're not burned by this one. We know that there's a CBA uh, renegotiation coming up, and I could honestly see um, a time where the CBA gets renegotiated and we get rid of the seven, eight, nine year deal. I think it may be something that gets negotiated out of there for teams to kind of save themselves. So I'm kind of glad the Flames don't have a seven, eight, nine year deal, whatever you might have thought we wanted here, because I think. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked about that either. We don't know what the next labor situation is going to look like, and this keeps everything flexible for both sides. We already see some teams who have those big deals, and they're regretting them. I mean, team is still paying Luongo, and he's retired, so I'd hate for that to happen to Matty. And as much as he looks healthy now, eight years is a long time. Who knows? He could get hurt. A lot of things could happen. Yeah, and plus, you know, you look at our team, like Giordano's not – He's 36 now, and you have Brody and Hamannick that are both UFA at the end of the year. Like, that's half your defense core, like three of your top four defensemen that are question marks for next season. We're going to need money to either re-sign those guys or find new guys to replace them. Yeah, and so, like, there's a lot that can change very quickly for a team like us. Uh, So... You know, having that shorter-term flexibility 
might actually be a good thing. As Flames fans, we always like it when our guy gets locked up long term and that shows the commitment to the team and all that. But I think the fact this expires when he still has one year of RFA time left pretty much means we're guaranteed four years out of him. Even if it becomes a one year arbitrated yeah. contract through a mediator, I'm pretty much guaranteeing he's going to be here for the next four at the very least. Yeah. Same here. So this yeah. deal makes Maddie the highest paid flame in history. In the last year of the deal, he's going to make $9 million, which is the most we've paid in a single season to a single player ever. The average, however, is $7 million. So there's always that ceiling that you can't make more than the captain who is making 6.75. He's broken that ceiling at age 21 already. I think it's pretty impressive that at age 21, he's now the highest paid flame ever. We're gl really glad to have him. Yep. Two other contracts that got signed this week were announced right after the Oilers game on Saturday. Tobias Reeder and Zach Ronaldo both getting a Flames contract. Uh, they're both $700,000 deals, which is the league minimum. Nice and cheap for this team. You and I had talked in the past about if any of the walk-on guys, the PTOs, deserved a contract. And we both said Tobias Reeder. So it's nice to see that he gets rewarded. He's still a young guy, and I think he'll be a benefit to the team, especially at a league minimum salary. Yeah, and he's only 26. So it's not like he's some old fogey or anything. Like he's still a young player and you know, he could end up if he rekindles what he was in Arizona, he could end up being a player that this team could use for a number of years even if he plays like he did with Arizona. So, you know, yeah, like if he gets 15 goals and 35 points, like that would be an amazing walk-on player. So. If we take a look at Reader's past numbers, I mean, he played three seasons in uh, Arizona, 2014 through 2017 full seasons, and he had 21 points the first year, 37 points the second year, and 34 points the third year. 2017-2018, he split between Arizona and L.A. He got 19 for Arizona and 6 for L.A. that year. Last year with Edmonton, he only had 11 points, so a bit of a blip on the radar, but if he can get back to that 20-30 point uh, mark, going to be great for this team at that price. Yeah, exactly. And he's at uh, the bare minimum is an excellent penalty killer. So that's one of the things that the Flames needed after losing Garnett Hathaway. And while his deal is technically a two-way deal, I can't see any way that Tobias Reeder clears waivers. So I'm not expecting him to serve any AHL time this year. Yeah, uh, it, he would have to like flame out entirely to get assigned to Stockton in which case then he'd get assigned to Stockton because other teams would be like yeah he sucks <laughs> we had Freddie Hamilton who was a pretty lousy forward and got claimed off waivers so I could see there being teams who would take a chance on him as their 13th forward depending on the time of the year just because of his pedigree yeah well that's the end of the transactions for the week obviously one more important than the other two and I'm glad that the Kachuk deal signed so we can finally talk about other things on the show, like waivers. Yay! Waivers. Uh, we have three players who were placed on waivers this week. We had John Gillies, Zach Ronaldo, and Alan Quine. Gillies cleared waivers. Ronaldo's on waivers but hasn't cleared yet, though I have no doubt he's going to. The one that's interesting to me is Quine. Do you think Quine's going to clear? Yeah, he should. You got to figure that teams are close to the 50 contract limit and Quine is that traditional too good for the AHL, not good enough for the NHL type player. For those that don't remember, waiver rules are that if you take a guy off waivers, you have to keep him on your NHL lineup all year. If you want to send him to the AHL, he gets optioned back to the original team. And I don't think there's any NHL franchise that is confident enough in Quine to keep him all year. So I think he's yeah. going to clear. That happened with uh, one of the Devils defensemen a number of years ago where he got picked up by Washington on waivers and he was terrible. And so they put him back on waivers and New Jersey got the first right of refusal. I know some people on Twitter were worried that Gillies might not clear, but really, I mean, is he good enough that any team would want to keep him as their number two all season? Probably not. You'd want that ability to send him to the AHL. Though now that he's cleared, I could see maybe there being a trade market for him we see that quite a bit. And I don't think anybody's going to claim Zach Ronaldo. I don't think yeah. anyone's confident enough to keep him all year. Oh, no. That's just like uh, Sven Berchi getting waived today. It's like, yeah, nobody's going to touch that contract. 
So, yeah, he might be good enough to be an NHL player, but, yeah, not really, not worth that. Just as an interesting note there, the Flames traded Sven Berchi to Vancouver for a second-round pick. That second-round pick became Rasmus Anderson, so that trade's looking better and better every day. Yep. Well, you see, at the end of the day, we ended up winning the two trades with Vancouver. You know. There you go. We win the trades, we win the games, we just win everything against Vancouver. Yep. The Ronaldo signing to me was an interesting one. If we take a look over the past couple seasons with Tanner Glass and some of these other guys they signed, they seem to like the idea of having a big bruiser signed to the team. They don't play any games here. I mean, we rarely see them play for the Flames, if at all. But I think the Flames like having that insurance policy signed up and in Stockton in case we need them. It'll be interesting to see when the Flames decide they do need that tough guy in the lineup, if it'll be Ronaldo or Lomberg that they call up. Yeah, well, it's, it, we'll probably see him as much as we did Peluso last year. A few times, and that's Yeah, it. I don't know. Like you said, Peluso, Glass, I don't know what it is, but the Flames like the idea of just having a tough guy on staff in case they need him, I guess. Well, it makes sense. You know, there are teams in our division that have those thuggish types. and Well, that's why we got Luch. You do need it, unfortunately. The next piece of news, unfortunately, yep. if you look back at that Edmonton game, we had Backlund leave in the second period. Nobody really knew what happened. I talked to Peters after the game, and he hadn't been fully updated yet. But Backlund is now listed as day-to-day. He's not expected to start the first game of the season against Colorado, but we're not sure about the uh, the home opener here in Calgary. The good news is the team is doing some team building stuff up in the mountains this weekend, and he is there. He's participating in the physical stuff. So I don't think it's too bad. The team's calling it precautionary, but if we don't start the season with Backlund on that second line, I'm a little bit worried. Yeah. And, you know, we'll just have to see how everybody else responds, frankly, and you probably will end up seeing Lindholm draw in on the second line as the center Could be. and, you know, yeah. put Could the be. line, the rest of the lines in the blender. For that first game on the road, I'm not too worried about what the line looks like. They can backfill. I'm only really worried if he's going to be out for the home opener or more than one game. But I think there's going to be a big push to get him back in the lineup for the home opener. That would be my guess, knowing this team. That's a big one every year for this team, and they're not going to rush him, but I think there's going to be a push to make sure he's ready for that one. Yeah. The last thing you'd like him to do is have him miss the first month of the season and derail, like, everything for the, the rest of the season. Yeah. No, you're right. Well, Matt, we got a two-part question on Facebook last week that I wanted to answer. The second part of this week, we wanted to wait until the end of the preseason. Dan Pru on Facebook asked us, what do you predict to be the opening night lineups? And we answered the first part last week. Let's answer the second part this week. I'll give you my lineup here first, and then you can chime in or tell me yours. I think on the forward side, we're not going to see any changes in the first two lines. I think the first line will be Johnny, Monty, Lindholm again. I think the second line, now that Kachuk is back, is Kachuk, Backlund, Froelich. Um, I think the third line is going to end up being Lucic, Ryan, and Bennett. And I'm really curious to see how that dynamic works. I'm hoping that Lucic can bring out some of that toughness that we saw from Sam Bennett in the playoffs last year. And that maybe Bennett can help Lucic with some of the scoring touch. And then I think the fourth line is going to be Andrew Mangiapane, Mark Jankowski, and Austin Zarnick to start the season. I don't necessarily think he'll stay that way the whole time. And obviously Tobias Reeder there being the 13th forward. It depends on uh, how confident they are in Lucic and his abilities. I could see Lucic even sliding into the second line in Froelich's spot. Possibly. Um... If they want to move somebody to the second line, I think you'd end up giving it to Bennett over Lucic. Yeah, it, it's it depends on like what they're going for. Like if they want to like really, 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 you know, tick off the opposition, having Lucic and Kachuk, ha- you know, being on the same line with each other, that might be fun. Um, they might do that once in a while, but I can't see yeah. that being a regular yeah. part of this lineup. I guess I'm um, kind of looking at their everyday standard lineup. Yeah. Um, I could see the 
yeah, it it's kind of hard to put together anything really different other than uh, I think Reader will be in the lineup full time and Zarnik the thirteenth forward. Yeah, um, I think that those guys will trade that spot for the first month or so of the season to see who looks better there. But I think the staff will put Zarnik in the starting spot to start the season. But we'll find out. Yeah. Zarnik can also um, play a little bit of center. So I could also see Jankowski coming out of the lineup and that last line being Monjapani, Zarnik, and Reader. Yeah. It, it's just frustrating that uh, both Dubé and Jankowski are both performing poorly. Uh, cause, so I'll give you my caveat here. This lineup, I think, is the lineup that we ice wins our first game. Uh, the 3rd of October. Yeah. I think this is the lineup that we ice for that game. I think there's still going to be some movement. There might even be a trade or two made. I can see by even a month later on November 3rd, this lineup looking a little bit different. But I think this is what we could expect, say, for the home yeah. opener. Oh, for sure. And, you know, th- th- those are like the the lines that you gave are basically the, like, that makes sense and see how things go kind of thing and then adapt based off of that because like you might throw Lucic with Ryan and Bennett and then find that they have zero chemistry with one another For sure. and then you might have to quickly even in the first game adapt and change that out and I guess I'm looking at what's going to be post on the dressing room yeah. wall for the Lions when they hit the ice against Vancouver mm-hmm. I agree and I think the first two defensive pairings for this team are easy to pick. Uh, Giordano and Brody are going to be number one. Hamannick and Hannafin, number two. Again, at least to start the season on home opener day. And I think that makes Anderson and Stone the third pairing. Um, That does leave Shillington as the odd man out. I think it's in some ways an easy choice for the team because he doesn't have to clear waivers, so it's easy to send him down. And Shillington just hasn't looked really great this preseason so i think sending him down yeah, to the hl might help him get some more play time as a high level guy and that's probably a lot better for him right now than uh sitting in the press box and i think that'll leave either brandon davidson or andrew mcdonald as the number seven yeah shillington's one of those players where if the flames were in like rebuild mode he would be getting plenty of ice time to figure things out in the nhl it's just that uh, you know, one of the benefits of being one of the best teams in the NHL, uh, you don't have room in the NHL for people to learn on the job. And I still believe fully in Shillington's potential to be a top four defenseman. I just, he has to work on a lot of things to get better. Yeah, for sure. And the AHL is a development league for that reason, right? It's designed to let guys develop and get their reps in and play hockey. And I would rather see Shillington going down there and developing and actually playing hockey than sitting in the press box eating popcorn and developing just through practices. The real interesting question to me is what's going to happen if and when Valimaki comes back during the regular season and how that will affect our... uh, our top seven. I have a feeling at that point, Val Mackey slots into the third pairing and Stone will just drop to number seven. Yeah, that's about right. Really nowhere for Shillington to play on this team. And the only thing I could see happen outside of an injury would be if Michael Stone looks really bad pulling Shillington up and putting him on that uh, third pairing. But I think with Michael Stone at 700,000, it's going to be hard for him not to justify his contract and to look so bad that they'd have to sit him. Yeah. And, you know, the third pairing, as long as they're not actively screwing your team up, like, they're fine. And, you know, like, you can handle Stone being the third pairing guy. And, like, there's... You've heard me in the past talk about the concept of the blind leading the blind. And I'm not a huge fan of Anderson and Shillington together on that third pair. Because I think there needs to be a veteran guy. And that's why I like the idea of Anderson playing with Stone, who can give that veteran Mm -hmm. leadership. I agree. Even Hannafin, I mean, he's, what, 22 years old, but it feels like he's been around the league forever. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I really like the hannafin Hamanick pairing, because Hamanick's a veteran guy, and I think it always works better if you look when you've got a younger guy with an older guy. There just always seems to be better chemistry. Yeah, so I like Phaneuf with Ham- uh, Hammerlick or a coin wow. back in the day. Wow, that brings back memories. Wow. 
I forgot that a coin was even a flame. Yeah. And then in net for this team, I think we can both agree that David Riddick gets the start for the home opener. Yeah. I think they're going to ride sure. Riddick until he either needs the rest or maybe loses a couple in a row. It's a pretty easy month. I don't think there's any back to back. So I think you're going to see Riddick probably play all, if not most of the games this month. Yeah, and like even if you look at the quality of competition, most of this month is not particularly exceptional. Like there's a few good games in there, yep. but not a ton. As you said, it's too bad that Dubé and Shillington are both going to start at the AHL level, but you know what? It's a circumstance thing. Both of those guys are waiver exempt, and it's the easiest move for the team to make. And I think if we look at that fourth line, I could even see with Jankowski, him getting uh, surpassed by Dubé if Dubé can play well in the AHL. And I wouldn't be surprised if the team tells Janko, you know what, you got to keep your spot because Dubé is breathing yeah. right down your neck. So if Dubé can improve and look better than he did in the preseason, I could definitely see him get a call up and be on that fourth line. And Jankowski, like, it's almost getting to the point with him where it might make more sense to move him to the wing even uh because he's still a decent penalty killer it's just that the whole center thing i think is not working for him i think if dubay's coming up and you're looking for him to replace janko at that point i think your best bet's just to move janko for whatever asset you can get yeah i agree i think if you're looking to try to move him to the wing we're already deep with wingers on both sides I think they've also got to try and find a spot for quine they really like him and i think he could slot in on that side so I think at this point, if it's a guy like Janko or Zarnik, instead of trying to repurpose them, just move them for whatever you can get and move on to the next asset. Yeah. I could see by Christmas, the Flames' fourth line even being Mongepani, Dubé, and Quine. Yeah, so good. I think that. there's a lot of options. And if you remember when uh, Bob Hartley was here and we had guys like Juris coming up, not because they were the most talented or the best guy in the AHL, but they were working hard and keeping their spot in the lineup. And I'm hoping, especially for that bottom six, we see some similar here where guys are working hard, they're playing their way onto that lineup, and the ones that are yeah, there are not the, necessarily the, the best hockey players, if you will, but the guys yeah, who are Yeah, and plus the, the Flames have enough depth. Like, our top nine are excellent, all nine players. So, you know, we don't need the fourth line guy to come in and be good. It's, you know, like it's just important that to have more depth basically and hoping that those guys can figure out how to play at a high level. Yeah. There's guys there like Manjapani and Dubé who probably have the potential to be a top nine, but there's balance there because the top nine is so deep. They're probably not going to get as much play time. They'll be relegated to fourth line minutes, but if you're not getting the play time, you're going to develop. So it can be a weird cycle there, and I'm going to be interested to see how the coaching staff manages that to make sure those guys are getting what they need to develop. Yeah, and you also have to determine like who you're playing and all that, and you know if the, that's a less good team, you can kind of get along with rolling your lines, and if it's a better team, you have to tighten things up a little bit. We've seen in the past that Peters has no problem rolling his lines, so at least that might be hopeful for those guys. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's move on, unless there's anything else about opening day rosters you want to chat about. Nope. I think we're on the same page here that it's nice when these things write themselves and the lineup really creates itself. And there's been years you and I have sat here going, well, these are the assets we have. Where do we put them in? How do we create lines out of this? And while we have some guys that could play on one wing or the other, really the top nine is solid and there's not a lot of question there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, those are those guys' spots. You know, th they'll figure it out, and yay. Like you said, even if Lucic moves up or down a little bit, we still know who that top nine are. Yeah. It, it's just like if Sam Bennett, say, starts the year off hot and plays well, he might push himself onto the second line. You know, and for Leak's spot, it just depends. Yeah, but that's also what you want. If you can get a guy in your top six, Definitely. especially a guy like Fro Leak, who I don't know if he'll be here at the end of the year, and you can get him replaced by a cheaper alternative because of a guy like Bennett or Dubé can take his spot, that's a great thing for the team. 
Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, I want to give a shout out to one of your favorite flames, a guy that I've criticized you a few times for how much you like him, and that's Ryan Lomberg. And maybe he'll be on the Flames' top six this year because he had a six-point game this week in Stockton. I never thought I'd say this, but Ryan Lomberg led the offensive onslaught in a game against Bakersfield where the uh, Stockton Heat ended up winning 7-5. to five. Well, you see, he copied Yager's hair, and the hair has the magical properties that's translated into the offensive talent. Do you remember He-Man, the master of the universe, used to pull a sword out from his shirt and say, by the power of Grayskull? Maybe Ryan will pull one out and say, by the power of hockey hair. (laughs) So if we take a look, uh, Ryan got an assist on the first goal. Like he scored his own goal at 820 into the second. He got a shorthander at some point in the game as well. I can't find the exact time here. And he had a whole bunch of assists. Oh, good for him. I never thought I'd see the day that Ryan Lomberg had a six-point night. It looks like two goals and four assists for Lomberg, and he was the first star of the night. You think? (laughs) Too bad it doesn't count for anything, but maybe he'll be the Flames' first call-up this season if he can keep racking up all these points, because... You know, they need some guys who can score. Well, he, like Garnett Hathaway, are that feisty guy who seems to be in the right spots on the ice. So, he... Yeah, but Hathaway never had a six-point night. You know, Hathaway's gone. Lomberg's probably not going to spend much time up here this year. I think you're going to find yourself a new favorite flame, Matt. Oh, I know. Well, we'll see how Lucic does. There you go. Yeah. You always like those sandpaper guys. Yeah, exactly. You know, the teams that other teams hate, you know, those are the type of guys I like. We'll have Ronaldo interview for Matt's favorite flame position. Yep, that works. We always play a game this time of year where we look ahead and make some predictions for the coming season. So I'll walk you through these questions and let's see what your answer is. First question, who do you think is going to have a breakout season for the Flames this year? Sam Bennett. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think Bennett has to this year. Um, I yeah. think my number two would actually be Lucic. I think he'll surprise for what we might see from him this year, but I'll put Bennett down for yeah, both of I us. Do too. I think Bennett's an age and a position in this team where we have to know what we have out of him, and this is his year to really show us. I think he's got more sandpaper than we've seen from him. I still think he might have more of a scoring touch than we've seen from him. So I think this is really the show me season for Sam Bennett for us to figure out what we've got there. Yeah. And plus he's, if he was on a lousier team, he would have had more opportunities to figure out how to, you know, like if he was say on like Vancouver last year, he would have been in the top six. And you look at, the flames like they don't need him to be a top six forward yet and so he's not getting as much opportunity to develop his offensive game but if he can start chipping in goals then he'll get more opportunity i would say they don't need to be a top six yet but next year cap wise i think that would be one of their hopes yeah. I think this is Bennett's year. I'm a bit disappointed that he shaved the stash off this year. I think he needs some of that Lanny energy. Honestly, I'm just kind of disappointed I can't go to Eastside Dodge and tell him that Benny sent me. But I think this will be uh, Bennett's year to really show us what he's got and if he has what it's going to take to move into that top six full-time. Yep. Who do you think will struggle most in the Flames lineup this year? Well, we've already discussed him at length, Mark Jankowski. And yeah, it it's just frustrating because he does have the tools to be a high-quality two-way forward in this league, and he just, for whatever reason, isn't being able to put it all together. I'm going to go in a different direction than you, and I'm going to say Mangiapani. I think that Andrew Mangiapani is a guy who has the talent to break out, has the skill to break out, but I think because of where he is in the lineup, uh, he's not going to maybe play as much as he needs to to get better and to get to that next level. So I think we might see him plateau and either have the same or worse numbers than he did last year. Yeah, that very well could be. We've seen a goaltending change for this team this year. Last year, I asked you, do you think that Mike Smith could stay healthy? So let's say, do you think our two goalies can stay healthy this year and play 82 games between them? Uh, 
should for the most part you might like even gillies played a few games last year and i could see well let's just say not because of injury yeah i could see one of them missing some time just with something minor it's kind of hard to predict one thing i do know is that our goaltending can't get any worse than it was last year uh because mike smith was just that bad for the entire regular season and yeah so I know not everyone shares my sentiment, but I'm excited about having Cam Talbot in as one of our goalies this year. Same here. I think that, you know, getting away from Edmonton will do him wonders. All right. The next question I have is how many games do you think Cam Talbot starts? Uh, probably 40. I think that Riddick will get most of the games early and then Talbot will take over. Sort of like that year that Chad Johnson like stole the show and uh, for a while stole the starting role from uh, Elliot. That was a weird year. Be that, yeah, I think it'll be something similar to that where uh, Talbot comes on strong after. Like, Riddick will probably struggle at some point, and I think Talbot will come in and rifle off a bunch so of So they pretty much split the season. Play I'm going to go yeah. with a more conservative number. Um, I think we'll see Talbot start 30 games this year. I think you're right. He could go on a run where he starts four or five in a row, but I really think the Flames want to get Riddick going for a playoff run and give him the minutes he needs to progress into a number one goalie. So I think you'll see Talbot probably play, let's say, 30 to 35. The next question, Matt, and I'll answer this one first. Who do you think will be the first call-up? Usually we do a forward and a defenseman. I'm going to go a little bit off the board. I think the first forward to get called up is going to be Alan Quine. I think the first defenseman will be Oliver Shillington. I'll go with Dubé and Shillington. And this can be the first call up for anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be because of an injury, um, especially early in the season. Usually we're not seeing guys come up and just get a look. So usually it's to replace someone who had an injury or... Someone's just not playing well, and they think they need a new body in the lineup. Who do you think will be the first guy who's currently wearing a Flames jersey that gets traded? Frolik. Really? Yep. We don't do well with this one at all. Usually the guys that we pick don't end up getting traded and often end up staying here for multiple years. Yeah. I'm going to go a bit of a different direction. I don't think that Frolik will be the first Flame traded just because I don't think that they necessarily have the top six depth to replace him. So I think if we're talking about the first guy yeah. traded, who's currently wearing a flaming C, it could very well be Janko. But even before him, um, I could see John Gillies yeah. getting traded. What do the Flames have to do this year to be successful? When you and I look back at this team in April, or hopefully late June, knock on wood, what are we going to look back and say that this is the thing that made this team in this season a success? Uh, the Flames need to at least make the conference finals, if not the Stanley Cup finals. Every year you say this team is going to do well, and then every year they go and disappoint us. So I think maybe you need to say next year this team's going to tank, they're going to get the first overall pick, and then they'll finally do well for us. Because I think you've been saying this is a team that can make yeah. the finals for like four seasons well, now. Well, actually, actually, you know, actually, I'm going to do myself one better. It'll be a disappointment if they do not at least make the Stanley Cup finals. And I So you, Stanley you Cup know, or bust for win. you? I'm going to say I think this team has to make at least a Western Conference yeah. Finals appearance. I've heard a lot of people online who think that a second round win would be great this year, but we've got a lot of big contracts. We got some older players. We got a window that's closing. I don't know if it's realistic to think that we'll go from a first round exit to winning the Stanley Cup, but I think we at least need to win the West. Um. You see, the thing is, is that because they fell on their face so hard last year, that if they do not find a way to be a winning team, then players have to be traded to make this team a winning team. Honestly, if this team doesn't have playoff success, it's more than the players. I think Tree's out of here. Yeah, the, the, if the they've swapped same the players, thing happens, they've swapped the coaches. I think yeah like if the same thing happens then yeah 
But no, if they fall flat in their face in the first round, then it's like, okay, yeah, something's wrong here. And we have to, on a personnel issue, you know, and we have to figure something out to change this up because something obviously is not right. Where do you think the Flames will finish in the Pacific Division regular season? First. I think the Flames will hold that number one position for most of the season, but I think a team like San Jose or Vegas might overtake them late in the season, so I'm going to say second. San Jose got significantly worse, and the Flames stayed the same, so I think that uh, I think that Vegas will actually finish out of the Sharks. Yeah. And those will be the only three teams from our division making the playoffs. You and I talked about this last year, but these are the years, really, if you look at it, that this division is really the Flames to lose, right? Yeah. Well, like, you look at the other five or four teams, L.A., uh, Arizona, uh, or five teams, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, they, like, all the teams that were missed the playoffs last year, they're all bad. And, like, they're not getting better, they're getting worse. And, you know, San Jose got worse, uh, Vegas stayed about the same, and Calgary, I think, upgraded quite a bit, actually, just by getting rid of Smith and Neal. So... You know, uh, you know, I I don't see there being any competition really in our division. Yeah, that's fair. I was going second. I'm going to stay there. I think we're all anticipating more of a storybook season for this team than I think we're going to get. And they have to have some adversity and something has to go wrong. And I think that might be the thing that goes wrong or doesn't go the way we anticipated. Yep. Next question. Do you think Kachuk's performance this year will match his pay as top flame? Yep. You think so? Yep. You think we're going to look back at this season and say, yeah, this guy took the team on his shoulders? Yep. I think he'll be one of the top two forwards on the team. And who do you think will be the Flames' unexpected playoff hero? Uh, some people last year would say Mangiapane. Who do you think it's going to be this year? Luch. You think Luch each steps up there? Yep. I'm going to say Sam Bennett. I think if Sam Bennett has the offensive season that I'm expecting him to, I think he could be one of the surprise pieces for the Flames and a guy that could get a lot of points. Okay, Dan, I have one more uh, question to add to the list. How many points? Sure, let's do it. How many points do you think the Flames are going to get? Regular season? I guess those are the only ones that matter, right? Nobody cares about playoff points. As long as you get 32. What did we get last season? Uh, 107. And Tampa Bay had how many last 128. year? I'm going 115. Yeah. What uh, do you think? I'm going to go a little higher and say 121, which will be the best record in Flames history. See, but every year you're overly optimistic in this thing. Every year it's the Flames will win the West. The Flames will win the playoffs. The Flames will win the Stanley well, Cup. Uh, the last, Flames will go play the KHL year, champions and they'll win that too. Yeah, well, last year on a different show, I said that the Flames would finish with 107 points, and they did, so I was a- accurate last year. Um, but, yeah, no, I think that they're... I think they're going to do better than they did like, last year, for sure, because they're going to have better goaltending. Yeah, because like, if you look at just the, the games that Mike Smith gave away, like that was about 13 points right there, where it was just him just, yeah, like not NHL goaltending causing, you know, the Flames to lose games. And that was about 13 points. And the team slightly improved in other areas. So, yeah, I'm going a little high. It'll probably be roughly what you said. It, this isn't something that we'll put in the prediction game, but at 121, based on what we saw last year, do you think the Flames will walk away with the President's Trophy? Yep, and I think they will. Yep. Interesting. Okay, yeah, we'll I think it'll be us in Tampa once again, 1-2 in the league. I know I said this last year, and I'm going to say it again, but I'm excited by where the team's at, and I'm excited to be a Flames fan this yeah. year. I think with all of the changes that the team has made and the new players that are coming in, I think this could be a really good year for this team. They need to step it up from last year, and they're disappointed by what happened last year in the playoffs, and they're going to step it up. And I think this could be the second best uh, season in Flames history. Yeah, and I think that this team, like, to have my, like, end-of-season predictions, um, 
I think that the Stanley Cup final will be us versus Tampa Bay. Yeah? Yeah. I think that both teams are going to have learned a lot from what happened last year and are just going to steamroll As everybody. much as I would like it for historical purposes to be Calgary versus Montreal again, I think, yeah. Well, y- y- we have to repeat. You know, we lose the first one, we win the second one. So, you know, we lost the first time against Montreal, we won the second one. We lose the first time to Tampa Bay. There, everything's the got to go in pairs, right? And it's a nice even number seven, so everything yeah. works out. Yeah, everything. I know, would love it if they won perfect. the Stanley Cup this year, that they had their retro reds on, so we could say we wore the same jerseys both time we won the cup. Yeah. That'd be awesome. We won't make this part of the prediction game, but do you think that we'll see the retro whites for more than just the outdoor game? I would assume so, because they tend to do that with... Uh, like the other games um that like the stadium series that like i think we'll probably see them during retro night which they usually do in march or april and i'm guessing that the whites will become the full-time road kit during the playoffs yeah i wouldn't be shocked if the flames went like full on retro home and away for the playoffs not this year oh yeah yeah yeah, during the playoffs i could totally see it during the playoffs but not the regular season yeah well, the regular season's upon us, which means it's time to start our weekly prediction game again. And I want to point out that last year I beat you handedly, nine to four at this game. You do every year because you know I yeah, <laughs> I'm not very good at this. So this is your year to beat me. Hopefully, you can be as successful as the Flames this year, and you can finally beat me for one year. So we got two games on tap this week. Thursday the third, the Flames are in Colorado. This game, I think, is more interesting now than it would have been a year ago because we know Colorado took us out of the playoffs. So let's see what we got this year. Then Saturday, the 5th, the Flames are here at 8 p.m. Calgary time, taking on the Vancouver Canucks for our home opener. So, Matt, we got two games, one on the road, one at home. How do you think we're going to do? Four points. You think we win them both? Wow. Yep. I think we're going to drop the game against Colorado, and we're going to win the one here against Vancouver. I think that the Flames are going to come out a little bit angry at Colorado and wanting to... I think so too, but all the excitement of the home opener, I think, might get Colorado pumped up. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, The one thing that I'm looking forward to this month, uh, it's an important month for the Flames because last year they had a really good October, and I think that's the reason why they ended up winning the division. And if you look at the month's schedule... There's not really that many games against good teams. Like, we play Nashville, Winnipeg, Washington, San Jose, uh, Vegas, Colorado, and, like, that's it for good teams. Like, everybody else is kind of on the mediocre side of things. I misspoke earlier when I said there were no back-to-backs this month. We do have two back-to-backs, so I think you'll probably see Talbot play at least twice. Yeah. Um, The Flames should win more of the games this month than they lose but we'll see uh they play 15 games and really this month that uh 10 and 5 should be about and right. six of those are at home mostly midweek games but i'm hoping that they can build some momentum even on those games and if you look at these road trips they're not that bad of road trips i mean last year there was a time that they had to go east and then come back west and i think go back east again these are all pretty simple trips. They're, you know, one night, maybe a couple nights, but they're not going too far from home. So hopefully they're not going to get really jet lagged. So I'm hoping that'll help the team get up with some of these and be ready to go. Carolina and Nashville, probably the toughest trips that we have this month. Yeah. And actually the Flames' own first uh, real long stretch of games against good teams doesn't come until the second half of November. So... Well, at least good teams from last year. Yeah. We'll see what happens. True enough. There's a couple teams here that I think could be on the fence. Yeah, well, like there's a game against Columbus, but you know, they're no they're no good now. <laughs> so uh, even in this first month, there's some good tests for the Flames. I think that Colorado game will be a good test. I think Dallas is going to be a really good team this year and I think that'll be a good test. Um Vegas, San Jose, Those will both be good tests, and I know they're one of your favorite teams, but I think the Florida game is going to be a good test. They've really bulked up. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, Yeah, Florida, even with Bob Brofsky, I think they're still kind of 
in that middling zone. Yeah, but I think that they have the potential we'll to break out. Yeah. Like if any, yeah, if anything, I think they'll be like an eight, seventh, eighth seed. I don't see them being any better than that. You and I talked about this a little bit last year, but if you take a look with any Eastern Conference team, we play essentially a home and home set, not always back to back, but there's one game in our barn and then there's one game in their barn. And you and I were noticing last year, we were burning those early and quite quickly among each other, I guess. Like we'd play one game here and then a week later we'd play one in their barn. And I'm starting to notice that again here. If you take a look, we have Philadelphia, and it looks like Washington. Um, and we're playing them once in October, and then Washington, once again in November. Yeah. So we're going to go through some of that again and start to burn those very quickly and be done the whole set very early in the season. Oh, I know. Like uh, Buffalo, we play on November 27th and then December 5th. It's like, okay, two out of three games against the same team, and then that's it for them. It, it is a little weird. Yeah, I don't know. If I were the league, I'd probably be spacing those out a little bit more, but then I'd also have us playing Edmonton earlier than December. Yeah, after Christmas, you know, so it's a little weird. We play the others, what, once in December and then again in January, so I'd almost like to see those spaced out better. Maybe do one in September, one in November, maybe one in January, one in February, something like that. Yeah. Odd schedule, but like you were saying, some momentum the Flames could build up early here. There's definitely going to be some good tests in this month and probably next month, but some good momentum for the team to build up early as well. And as we've talked about, that's not always the case. This team often struggles early in the season. So if they can... Yeah, last year was like the first time in recent memory that they actually had a good start to the season, and then lo and behold, they won the division because of it. Yeah, we've talked in the past about how it's often not worth covering until Christmas. Yeah, well, like that, you just get used to that seven-game winning streak in December. Like, call me when that starts, and then I'll be ready to go. If they can put some points up (laughs) early, I think they have a really good chance of winning this division, as you mentioned earlier. And we don't want to put those points up late because as we've seen in the past, you get hurt or something goes wrong and you're fighting for those late points. So the more we can get that cushion up front, the better off we're going to do. Yeah, and especially with Vegas and San Jose, they're playing each other quite a bit right off the hop. And And we see them both in the first month of the season, so I think those are both must-win games. Yeah, like those, frankly, are the only two teams I'm concerned about from our division because the other ones are all kind of bad. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I don't... The teams will... The team will have to just get out going right off the hop to hopefully start the season on the right foot. Well, Matt, I hope you're right. And that when we talk next, the flames have four points already. Enjoy these two games this week. Enjoy the Colorado game, but especially enjoy that home opener. Cause that's always so much fun. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you next week. Oh. And as always go flames, go fireside chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.